Thank you, everyone. Buenas tardes, Lambda World. You can hear that, right? Cool, just wetting your appetite. So the reason that I chose King Gizzard and the Wizard Lizard, it was partly because I was hoping that Luis would try to say the band name. Um, but the other reason is that there's, for hipster musicians among you, you might know that uh, they use microtones in their music. Um, I'm getting some nods from people who spend too much time on like music Wikipedia, like myself. Anyway, that will become relevant at the end. Cool. So welcome to my talk, The Butcher Bird Combinator. Right? So in my day job, I work for a company called ThoughtWorks, and I do not do music as code talks. Right? I don't, I don't uh, create code that creates sound. I, I work, like many of you, on, on things that are solving business problems. But I do do a lot of modeling, and I do make a lot of decisions. And like all of you, as a programmer and a technologist, I make worlds in tech that have to match up with the world outside tech. And the decisions I make and how I model that are going to be important when it comes to how my systems behave over time. So this talk is on the surface about uh, the butcher bird and its music, and I hope you enjoy that. Um, but the other point I have of uh, giving this talk to you today is to think about modeling and, and our position relative to users who might be different and have different values or different culture than we do. So speaking of different culture, because I know there's a lot of Scala people here, this is Lisp, um, and I'm going to execute this uh, in, the, in the editor. So basically what's happening here is there's a REPL, I'm just typing some commands in Vim and executing it. So uh, in Lisp, by the way, uh, if you see this line here that I've got highlighted, that's how you multiply things. So Lisp is a little bit weird in that the operator comes first and then the arguments. Um, this is plus or addition. Right? Um, so uh, it's a bit weird if you're used to maths and notation, but I guess the advantage is consistency by modeling things that way. There's a whole bunch of different things you can do in your editor and with macros and so on, so it's kind of convenient. Now, Clojure and Lisp in general is usually not a pure programming language, so you can just shove side effects into random code. So, for example, here's some all right, bird song, I hope. So that, that was a side effect from me executing a recording of a butcher bird. So just to go back, what is a butcher bird? Like, that's a pretty gross name, right? Well, it's actually because it has a slightly gross habit, right? So the butcher bird is a bird about this long. It's a, kind of a bit like a magpie you might know in Europe. It's an Australian bird. Uh, it's especially common in Western Australia, where I visited with my dad. We went camping recently, so we saw, or more importantly, heard some butcher birds. Um, what it does is where you have like a nest... Um, it stores things it's caught on like sticks coming out of the nest. So this is why it's like it has like a larder behavior basically. And you know, obviously we do the same thing as people all the time. So I don't know why we would be disgusted with an animal doing it. But that's why it's called the butcher bird because it basically has a little butcher's shop of food that it's storing there. Right. And so um, that's the that's the the bird. And obviously I cannot uh, firsthand have experienced butcher bird culture because. Uh, animals and humans don't quite see eye to eye all, uh, the whole time, but I'm going to try and explain the music theory and the way that the Butcher Bird song works in a way that uh, hopefully we can understand. Um, but I, I got asked earlier by someone at the conference what my talk was about, and clearly they didn't just want me to say what the description said, right? Or they would, they would have uh, not asked the question. And so the first thing that I answered was, ah, it's about the difference between addition and multiplication, and and they were like, oh, really? Uh, maybe I, I might go to the other talk then? And I was like, no, you can't, because this is the first talk, so there is no other talk at the moment. You have to come to mine. But don't worry, don't worry. It's actually a little bit more than that. So in particular, I think that I've decided this talk is about the difference between etic versus emic modeling. So this is a distinction in anthropology. So the emic approach is an insider's perspective which looks at the beliefs, values, and practices of a particular culture from the perspective of people who live within that culture, right? An inside of you. And an ethic approach, on the other hand, is an outsider's perspective. So someone who isn't from that culture, maybe who doesn't really understand what makes it tick, talking about it from the outside. So you get this all the time, I guess, in, uh, I don't know, 
uh, musical cultures where you might have someone who's analyzing a hip hop who's from a classical tradition and they'll use the terminology and the models of music that they understand from their own background. Um, or you might, on the other hand, have people writing about how hip hop works who are deeply invested in hip hop culture. So this is quite important, I think, as programmers because uh, when it comes to programming tools, we are able to be the user, to understand the user, to inhabit the world that we're modeling from the inside. But when it comes to a lot of software that we write, a lot of our users don't have exactly the same point of view and culture as us, right? So to become a programmer, you have to have a certain way of looking at things. You have to be educated. You have to have the right opportunities. There's correlations in terms of you know, ethnicity and gender, in terms of uh, makeup of the programming profession. So we have to somehow try to work out how we can model the world in a way that will be useful to our users and not make too many assumptions as outsiders that'll mess up our users' experiences. That's, what, that's why I think this distinction is important. And obviously, a butcher bird or a bird is an ultimate example of us needing to be different from the users because you know, they're a different species, they don't speak our language. So uh, if I can just get into the topic of modelling, representation matters. And I'm not talking about, oh, it's good to have diverse teams, etc. It is good to have diverse teams. But I'm actually talking about the way you structure internally your program. So these two uh, stanzas here, raw and computed, actually contain the same value. So if I execute this equality, it comes out as true. But if you look at the way uh, they're constructed, it's quite different, right? So this line is a raw list of integers. And if you looked at it, you kind of might be able to reverse engineer a structure. You're like, actually, wait, is there, are there six sixes or are there five sixes, right? So you might be able to figure it out. But on the other hand, if you look at this uh, thing, which you might be able to understand even if you're not familiar with Clojure and Lisp, this says that I take the range of numbers one to eight. For each of them, I make as many copies as the number, and then I concatenate the whole thing together, right? So even though it is... Uh, the result is the same, the modeling is different and has different effects. In particular, I would say that the triumph of a good domain model is that when you have to change it, a small change in your intention becomes a small change in your program. So let's say I wanted only to keep the even numbers. It's very easy for me to update this version and there I have only the even numbers. In the case of the raw one, I guess I could edit and remove all the twos and the fours, oh sorry, remove the ones and the threes, etc. But in the case of the, uh, uh, the second, the computed one, I'm able to make an edit that's natural. And I guess that's because I've, I've modeled it in a way that is consistent with what's actually going on. So uh, the discipline, or the academic discipline, that talks about study of bird music is called zoomusicology and it's kind of not really accepted it doesn't really exist yet like people talk about it people write about it but there's no you know you can't find a department of zoomusicology in any university anyway um, but the two sources i have that uh, are really good for informing this talk um, is the book is bird song music by hollis taylor which is about the pied butcher bird that bird that i played to you earlier and another source, which is a paper called Overtone-Based Pitch Selection in the Hermit Thrush Song. And these two things together are the, the source of the theory of what I'm going to build on in this talk. So if you want to check my workings or investigate further, that's where they come from. Um, I would definitely say the book, which I really quite like it. It's kind of a, a weird and beautiful book. Don't look at me like that. That's a compliment. You're all at a programming conference. Everyone here is weird and beautiful. Um, but it's, it's kind of like by a classical violinist who's gone around and recorded the butcher bird and then tried to work out what, what the songs mean musically. Like treating the butcher bird not as a kind of specimen, but as a colleague, as a musician, someone to be taken seriously. And then, you know, she sees what the implications are of that approach. The overtone based pick selection is, um, is some theory about how the structure of mute bird song works that I'll draw on. So there is actually a question in some people's minds about whether birdsong is music. And I guess I could have structured this talk to answer that question, but to be honest, I think it's actually kind of a question that misses the point, right? So um, some people are very keen on the, 
humanity and distinctly, uniquely homo sapiens characteristics of music. And so they attempt to define music in a way that it cannot be done by, you know, a whale or a bird or anything like this. So they say, you know, it's about having a soul and the bird doesn't have a soul. So there you go. Um, I don't find... I don't really want to argue with that. I just think it's kind of missing the point. Like, I don't want to be the kind of person who listens to birdsong and goes, that's not music, right? I, I think this is useful to me as an analysis to listen to it, to structure it in my head as though it's music, to think of it as maybe foreign music, interesting music, but to process it that way as, as an art form. Um, and the, really, the, you know, the biggest argument that it's music, I think, is just to listen to it. And by the way, that, that specimen is really good because what it does is it shows you that birds are capable of doing repetition and variation, which is one of those things that people claim that birdsong doesn't have, which is, as you've heard, just uh, not true. Uh, this is the hermit thrush, which is the subject of the, the paper, just for completeness. So it's the first time. Repetition. And the third time, it, it's buried it, right? I think that's quite melodic. If that's not music, I still think I, my life is better from thinking of it that way. Cool. So the first thing we have to understand if we're going to start modelling music of birds or humans or anything is that frequency is pitch, right? So when you hear a sound that is high or low, what you're hearing is either the airwaves vibrating quickly or vibrating more slowly, so if I just make a tone of uh, 300 hertz, which means it's vibrating 300 times a second, you'll hear it. Uh, and if I make it 400 times, it's high. And if I make it, let's say, 100, it's low. Right? So the frequency of that signal is the subjective pitch that you've experienced. But I actually had to kill the signal there because so far we haven't talked about the duration of notes or how they exist in time. We've just talked about whether they're high or low. So that's the next bit of abstraction that we need to talk about, shaping notes. So the way we shape notes when we're modeling it with synthesizer um, is that we create an envelope for the sound. So rather than just the frequency going on forever as an eternal signal, we create an envelope where it gets loud and then it gets softer and then the note disappears. So what this says here is I'm going to have a percussive envelope that takes 0.3 seconds to get loud and then 0.9 seconds to fade away again. And it'll, it'll create something a bit, oops, a bit more reasonable. Oops. By the way, you know, this is all live coded. It is entirely possible to, just like in your day job evaluator, uh, infinite sequence or something that will actually crash the JVM. So it's entirely possible that'll happen. But I think the, the danger of that is part of the thrill, right? Cool. So that's how you shape notes. Um, now, there's something else that's kind of interesting about music. So, especially in human music, it's not all human music, so we like to play multiple sounds at the same time. And sometimes when you play two sounds at the same time, they sound good, and sometimes they sound bad. So, for a first approximation, what I will say is that if you have a simple fraction between the two sounds, they sound good together. Big asterisk that I'll come to in a second. So if I play 300 hertz and 500 hertz at the same time, I get this kind of harmony. Maybe if I do 300 and 400, that's also a nice harmony. 300 and 600. Well, they almost sounded like the same thing, right? That 300 and 600, right? It almost blended into one signal. And if I do something, I don't know if that's a, hopefully that's not some hidden fraction. That was like, much wonkier, right? You can almost hear a wobble. Uh, and I'll explain why that is in a second, but first I'll explain the asterisk. So there is pure mathematics in music, but all music is interpreted through culture. And what sounds good or what sounds weird is based on the expectation you have from the music you're familiar with, right? So uh, that, in fact, I think uh, three against four, like a fourth, um, I think that was regarded as like a dissonance in medieval European music. Sounds pretty nice to me, right? But there was a certain point in time when people would be like, that's a dissonance that needs to be resolved. Um, maybe I can also go uh, five to seven. 
that's kind of a, in some people, a sour note. But also that interval is used a lot in funk music where it kind of like sits there with just a little bit of a unresolved flavor that maybe lasts through the whole song if you have a, a funk uh, piece that's based on a dominant chord. So your expectation plays a lot uh, of, a, of a role in this. The other thing I want to say is that uh, this is not something that depends on exact measurements which is lucky because the world is not exact, right? So if it only sounded good if it was exactly five on four, then, well, you wouldn't really get that because every real instrument has little imperfections. Every real situation has some kind of distortion, right? So that's, you know, fractions sound good roughly. So why do fractions sound good? So to explain that, I have to talk about the concept of harmonics, right? So first I told you, that frequency is pitch. So I'm basically just saying that a sound is a sine wave going up and down. Actually, it's a pressure wave going like this, but let's just say it's going like this. Now, in reality, it's not just one sine wave. It's a series of sine waves, a harmonic progression of sine waves. So you might be familiar with that term in, in mathematics. So this instrument boop that I've defined doesn't just have one frequency. It has a frequency at the base frequency, it has another sine wave at double that, another one at triple, another at quadruple, another at five. So there's, there's a whole family of sounds that are related by being multiples of the bass sound. Um, and so let me just maybe play that boop. So it kind of sounds like there's more to it. And the reason that happens, I'll just have this slinky spring as a demo, right? So if you imagine um, this is a guitar string, it might, you pluck it and it vibrates. Right? And so you can imagine how this would generate a sound of a certain frequency. But you can also see that if you double the speed, that other sine wave is able to inhabit and resonate within the string. And in fact, if I could get three going, yeah, that's the third harmonic. And I won't try to go four and five because it's kind of a bit difficult with slinky string. So that's the, that's the case with all real physical sources of sound, whether you're talking about a, you know, a, a, an instrument that's based on a string, based on a tube, etc., you have this whole harmonic progression. So that's part of strushing it well. So why do sounds sound good together? Well, if they are related by fractions, well, what you're getting is a, a lowest common multiple that is low, right? So there are, if I have um, these two sounds that are three and 300 and 500, then the fifth harmonic of one and the third harmonic of the other are actually the same frequency. So they're kind of overlapping, they're reinforcing. So if I just play the 300 and 500 together. So the fact that they're simple fractions means that in the harmonic series, there's kind of an interlock. Your ears can hear when, when these things are going together. If they had a really a wonky fraction between them, like, I don't know, 7 to 13 or something like that, then you wouldn't find those low dominant harmonics reinforcing each other, and so it doesn't sound very good. Uh, one thing that is an interesting phenomenon that I'll uh, get to in a second is that you can see that the distance between each of these harmonics is the same, right? So if the, if the bass frequency is 100 hertz, then the next one is 200, the next one is 300, the next is 400, right? We, we covered addition early on, right? So I think hopefully, hopefully you remember how addition works. So we've just got this kind of fixed grid. Um, but then when we're talking about... Uh, the, uh, the ratio between things, we're talking about multiplication. So these two fundamental bases of how to think about music, adding, stacking sounds together and multiplying ratios together, these are both present in this little thing. And I'll, I'll come in a second to a divergence between how human music and how bird music works. Right, so this is where we have to get to this, uh, this uh, concept of modeling, right? So a human scale, I can just evaluate this, is based on uh, multiplying. So I'm going to call it the exponential scale. Cool. So just checking that my guitar works. So basically, between two notes that are an octave apart in human music, they must sound the same. There's a doubling of frequency between these two, right? So I don't actually know what it is, but let's say this is 200 hertz. This is 400 hertz or whatever. And so ratio between them that sounds good because especially if you think about these multiples, there's a lot of harmonics that they have in common, right? So if we have every second harmonic is shared, right? Now, in between, there are 12 notes. So if we're following this principle of multiplication, then what that means is that each time we move up a note, 
we're moving up the 12th root of 2. Right? So that's the difference between adjacent nodes. And clearly I'm tuning this keyboard right now like it's a human instrument. We'll get to the, the bird bit in a second. So if we go back to the code, um, we can model it by just saying we'll get the 12th root of 2, and then we'll just exponentiate as many times as we need to get to the note that we need to play. Uh, and by the way, this is starting to make an assumption about what sounds are relevant and what sounds are not relevant. Right? So if we just think about the frequency spectrum, any frequency is possible. Right? But now this has buttons, right? This has discrete buttons. There's no way for me to play on this instrument the notes between the buttons. Right? So I've started by modeling this way, which is consistent with how we model music. I've started to make decisions that affect what things I can represent and what things that I can't represent. Um, so let's just play the exponential scale, which, or it, with, with some jumps between them. So for music people among you might have heard that I have both the major and the minor seventh, so it's like a bebop scale rather than a major scale. I can see Benji knows that. Uh, don't worry about that, but you can get yourself bonus points, Benji, for, for spotting that, yeah. Uh, and you'll see why in a second I've done that, just to be comparable with the bird scale. So that's how we work. The 12th root of 2, we multiply over and over again, and that tells us what frequencies in the key we are that we actually play in our piece of music as humans. Right, uh, so when um, Hollis Taylor, who is um, writing this book, chooses to notate the bird song, she chooses Western music notation, right? So she chooses this system of dots on a page. And that's a really cool system because it's, people have found it's a really useful way to read music and then work out what note you have to play quickly. It's, you know, it's visual. The higher the dot, the higher the frequency, the left and right of the uh, of note tells you when it happens. Um, but she's made that decision to use human notation to describe the bird. So you can see that there might be a little bit of a conflict here, right? Because uh, Hollis Taylor is trying very hard to think about birds as you know, musicians that are colleagues that can be taken seriously, that might have insights that we don't. But when she's resorting to notation that's built for her mindset, then she's approaching it in an etic way, not an emic way. She's approaching it from outside the bird's culture. Uh, I don't blame her for this, um, right? So I don't think the right way to solve this problem with modelling is just to represent, you know, raw bits, raw data at all times. I don't. Th I think think that's, you know, useful. So this is the same piece of music, but rather than with dots, it's with, uh, you know, just a frequency spectrum. Uh, to start with, how I visualize this, there's a whole bunch of choices. I could have a logarithmic scale. I could have a linear scale, all sorts of things. But also, just it's really hard to see what's going on from this. It's hard. Maybe there are two notes that are slightly different in frequency that really I should think about as the same thing. One cool thing, though, that I th will note is you can see the harmonics here, right? So uh, if you see these shadow bars above the really loud note, that's what I told you earlier when every sound has multiples of itself hidden away there. So this, this shows that. But on the other hand, maybe that's not actually relevant to analyzing the piece of music that you want to analyze. So you have to make these choices. I'm not blaming Hollis Taylor for using Western music notation, but I am trying to point out the consequences of it because as programmers, when we do make a modeling decision, it is right that sometimes we choose a model for uh, convenience or to allow us to you know, have a consistent way of representing something we can then calculate over. Right? So it has to be done, but we should bear in mind the consequences. So when I play the bird scale, um, which is a, is a linear scale. So rather than there being a multiplication of the 12th root of 2 each time, the bird scale works the same way as those harmonics. So each sound has a distance of the same uh, thing. So if, if it was 100, it would be 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, etc. Um, what that means is that at the low end, there's less notes that the bird selects, at the high end, there's more birds notes that the bird has than, than we have. Now let me just play it for you. Right? So that kind of sounds similar, and that's because of a really awesome coincidence that at a certain point, from basically the 8th harmonic to the 16th harmonic, the 12th root of 2 
multiplication comes up with a really nice approximation of several fractions, right? So it gets close to the ratio of uh, 5 and 4. It gets close to the ratio of 3 on 2. Um, but actually, it's not quite the same. But I, I think if you're a musician, you might hear this scale as slightly maybe out of tune, but it's kind of hard to tell the difference, I think. Uh, but this is basically that paper that I referenced at the start. This is how it says that birds hear music. There are sometimes human examples of using this concept of just a linear scale. So uh, I think there was someone from Switzerland, right? So, uh, you know, those huge Alpen horns, right, that we have, the, the, the Swiss people... I'm sure they don't use it every every day for you know tune it at the pub or whatever. But like, there's huge uh, uh, horns. They can only select harmonics of the same bass frequency, so they're just doing that basically the same thing as a bird. But generally, humans use the multiplication system. So I, I thought it might be easier to compare and contrast the two scales if I play them at the same time. So you'll hear where they diverge and where they converge. Um, so I'm going to play the exponential scale, so that's the one that humans usually use, with the linear scale, and at the same time. Can you hear that some of those are more kind of sour than others? I'll give you another go. All right. Right, so you can hear that they're similar, but not exactly the same. That's kind of dangerous when it comes to the kind of notation and analysis that Hollis Taylor is doing in her book, because if things are kind of close and you want them to be close and it's convenient for them to be close, then as you're doing your modeling, you can make assumptions. You can round things off so that they end up fitting in the, the buckets or the model that you'd like to have. Um, but yeah, that's, I just thought I might show you the uh, the... Um, the fact that these things get quite close. So, see, if you see that number there, 1.2599, it's very close to 5 and 4, right? It's kind of similar. So that's how we get if we multiply the 12th root of 2 over and over again. So it kind of gets us close enough. Not exactly the same, but, uh, but close enough to work really well. Um, actually, maybe I'll, I'll try playing something on the guitar to illustrate the thing as well. So um, the bird scale is really good at getting exact pure ratios for some of the differences between uh, notes. So this is what it sounds like when we use a kind of a human scale for the major third, that approximation. Kind of sounds nice, but you can imagine that this is like the horn of a car that's a bit out of tune as well. There's like... It's kind of like just soupy. Now I'm going to switch it over to play... Uh, on the guitar, what a bird would, would uh, probably play, and then we can maybe hear the difference. So listen for that kind of buzzing effect. Whoops, no, sorry, that was a mistake. Right, so it's very close, but here you have that almost spiky. It feels, I don't know, for me it feels like I'm tasting kind of like that, um, that kind of uh, sherbet on my tongue. It's more exact. That's exactly 5 and 4 ratio between the two. Whereas the human scale, though it's very convenient and has all sorts of other musicological justifications, um, is not really uh, quite as good for that. So, you know, we shouldn't assume, by the way, that when we're comparing what humans do and what other animals do, or other uh, beings do, that we're talking about the human man being right and the other one being wrong, or the human one being the best and other ones being imitations. But right? if we take that approach where we value things by how close they are to how humans do things, then naturally the consequence of that kind of investigation will be that the others suck a little bit. Some of them will suck a bit, some of them will suck more, but overall we won't really give them a full chance. We won't be approaching their qualities, we won't be approaching their benefits from the inside, from that uh, emic approach. Uh, cool. All right. So um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is octave equivalence. So I think I played you two sounds before that were double each, and they sounded very close. They kind of blended into each other. So in uh, human cultures, generally we consider that 
A in one octave and A in the octave above with double the frequency is kind of the same thing in the same way that, you know, 10 a.m. Uh, is the same as 10 a.m. the next day. It's, kind of, it's not the same, right? They're on two different days, but there's some idea of cyclicalness between them. Um, so if I'm going to play uh, this children's rhyme, row, row, row your boat, just a little bit of it, and then I'm going to play it again one octave up, I think you'll hear kind of the two melodies as being the same melody twice. All right, I'll play it again. So the second one is clearly higher, but in some sense it's saying the same thing, maybe I could say. Now I'm highlighting this octave equivalence because that octave equivalence is very closely connected to the physicality of being a human, right? We have kind of a bimodal population. We have some people with smaller voice boxes. We have some people with larger voice boxes. And if they want to sing together, we have to have some way of people that don't have the same range singing the same song. So to us, we have this octave equivalence. If you double the frequency and play it, then we kind of consider it to be the same thing. Now, the reason I'm pointing this out is this is not true for pied butcher birds or many other species, right? They're, they're the same size, the male and the female. They don't have obvious subpopulations that are different size. So we shouldn't expect this musicological phenomenon of octave equivalence to hold for other people who have no kind of basis for it. But, uh, as we'll show in a bit, um, Hollis Taylor does kind of go looking for this in her book, and that's one of the things that I, I quibble with her about. So one of the, uh, the things that's very distinctive about the butcher bird, as well as its variation, is it kind of has a, a motif, a theme, a series of notes that is often sung by different members of the species, right? So that's one of the ways that if you're out in the bush, um, you can hear um, the distinction between maybe it's a butcher bird or maybe it's another bird. Um, it's called a species call, often people say. So it's kind of like, you know, a little bit of a thing that might be blended in, reinterpreted, reimagined by different butcher birds. Um, and it sounds like this. That's in my model. To be clear, I'm not trying to make it sound exactly the same as a butcher bird. I'm trying to make it capture the essence of, a, of it by selecting uh, that, that pattern. So if I play a recording of a butcher bird who's playing around, but he is playing this species call, you'll hear this. You can hear that do 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 over and over again. Oh, it was nice, it echoed me then, right? Right? So this species call is a, is a, a feature of the music theory of the butcher bird. It's, it's, it's fitted in there somewhere. And you know, the nice thing is that because we're representing things as code, I can, you know, I can show you that that's what it looks like. And later on, when we encounter it in another recording, I can refer back to this as a kind of an abstraction of thing I've modeled. Right, so uh, here's an example of using the species call inside a thing I've modeled. So uh, rather than using Western music notation, I'm going to um, I'm going to use my uh, linear scale concept. I'm going to use th what the that paper said, and I'm going to model the pitches as being exact multiples of a bass frequency. And I'm going to use this model to show you that actually I think it's onto something, right? That there is, there is, it is kind of a good way to think about birdsong. So first, I'm going to uh, um, just play the, the the raw thing. And now I'm going to play it along with my transcription of it. Right? And it doesn't sound exactly the same. I, I always think when I hear this, it sounds... Does anyone know about Different Trains by Steve Reich? There's, a, there's an artwork uh, where it gets human voice and then they play uh, stringed instruments alongside it. And it's a way of kind of calling out the, the musicality of the human voice. In any case, I think this, this uh, by playing these next to each other and having you hear that they kind of match, I think demonstrates that this, using this exact multiples business is at least plausible, right? So I'll play it once more. Note, by the way, that um, one of the nice things of having an internal model, an internal DSL for things like this, is that you can create new abstractions as you need to. So 
I've noticed that this line and this line are the same, just looking at it now. So if I wanted to kind of, you know, create a let uh, that does this, I'm going to say I'm going to have the opening. And then if I just play it, it all should work as well. Whoops. Require, let requires an even number. Ah. Whoops, I didn't actually transcribe it. All right, that let should work now. Oops, no, it does. Brack oh, that's always the problem. Where the the problem is that there's too many brackets. All right, in the let. Yeah. Oh, I think rather I, I appreciate the yelling out from the crowd, but I think rather than bore you with me fixing it now, I'm going to get you to trust me, and I'm going to move on to the next thing. But I very much appreciate the the help. I think you get the point, and if you didn't, you wouldn't have been able to be helpful to me like that. All right. All right. So consider that the the obligatory proof point that this is live coding, and it can be very easy to get things wrong. Right, so finally, I thought I might be a try to be a little bit pseudo-scientific about this, so I thought that I might try to like do some analysis about whether the uh, human scale applied to Butcher Bird's song works better or worse than the linear scale. Um, so if I do a differences of squares measurement, which is what's the methodology in the paper, um, we get 942 for the exponential scale, and we get 563 for the linear scale. Okay, lower is better, so that kind of works. Uh, I've obviously cherry-picked the example. This is not scientific rigor, right? Um, hopefully that's at least plausible. But I, I realize that that's kind of, that's a very etic way of looking at it, right? It's a very specimen-like way. So I wanted to maybe engage a little bit better just before I do the final um, thing to finish off, um, is to... Uh, examine what Oculus Taylor says in her book and have a look for this etic versus emic distinction. So at one point, she says that half-sharp signs indicate the duet's microtonal nature. Right? So this is a quote. Microtone means, ah, you know how we have the, the notes on the a keyboard? Well, microtone means they're playing notes in between. Right? <laughs> now, on one hand, that could be a compliment. And remember at the start, for example, King Gizzard and the Wizard Lizard, the band, they use microtonal music, and that means they create special guitars with extra frets on, right? So that's kind of a cool hipster thing to do. On the other hand, to me, this sounds a lot more like Hollis Taylor might have chosen the wrong pitches, right? Her model might be wrong, and so when she's thinking they, they're like extra sophisticated, it might be that just that she's modeled things not quite complete in the first place. I see more signs of it here. I hear a melody with accompaniment a la Mozart to Chopin, a solo piano work performed instead by duetting birds. Now the subtle thing here is that the comparison to Mozart and Chopin is meant to be a compliment, right? Okay, these birds are like humans, that means these birds are good. Now, it is cool, it's a cool observation, but it kind of shows a value system that is operating from the outside. And then the final one I wanted to mention, to get back to the octave equivalents, uh, is that Hollis says that readings in neuroscience and the psychology of music indicate only certain mammals have a sense of octave generalization. Hide butcher birds might as assist us in revising our understanding of this. So you can see how she's kind of hedging, but she's really enthusiastic for the idea that pied butcher birds might have octave equivalents. I think that's implausible because they don't have a bimodal population of size. They have no reason to think in that way. It's kind of a very human-centric way to compliment them or kind of hope to compliment them for doing this. Um, but I think that's kind of what she's, what she's trying to do here. So to be clear, I think it's a wonderful book. If you want to read it, I, I, I recommend it. Um, and I'll, you know, uh, I can share it with anyone later who wants. But uh, I'm just trying to share as programmers this danger of approaching phenomena with our own glasses on. That if we, you know, if we are trying to model phenomena for people who are not like ourselves, we have to be really careful about the choices we make. Otherwise, uh, you know, we might find ourselves uh, excluding something that we can't even properly see. I mean, you know, there's obvious examples of that with online forms, you know, around, you know, 
Should they represent gender? Should, how should they represent gender? Should we collect age? Shouldn't we collect age? There's all sorts of decisions that we make when we're modeling software that do have implications for how we serve our users that are dependent on our point of view. So we have to choose. There is no way of not choosing, but uh, we should be a bit careful. So I hope I have a little bit of time because I just wanted to do one last thing before I was threatened by Rowena of being uh, hauled off the stage uh, earlier, but I might, I might see if I can uh, outlast her just a bit. So I said that I wanted to be thinking about this from within the birdsong, and I'm clearly not. I am Australian, but I'm not a bird. Um, I can make an attempt, because I'm a programmer, to adapt my abstractions to what the bird might think. Um, but I, th I think one thing I can do is, because I have this keta that I've reprogrammed to work using the bird scale, well, you can just play a little bit of music to finish up that tries to use their scale rather than ours. Now, this is kind of difficult, so if the musicians among you, that means that I don't have a usable like fourth or sixth. Uh, some things sound really good, some things sound really sour. Um, but maybe it should, because maybe you'd be listening to something that is operating from outside a framework that you're used to. So I just play uh, these things on the Corgan. I, that's kind of awkward, right? Because I have to type, and even though we love using you know, our favorite editors, um, it's not really good, as good as a direct interface. So let me uh, maybe just loop some birdsong music and then attempt to play along with it for a little bit. Um, one other advantage of doing this, by the way, is we're going to hear the music a little bit more in its proper context. When you hear Butcher Bird's song, you're not just hearing normally in the wild, you're not just hearing one bird performing you, it's not on a stage, you're not in the audience, you're hearing kind of a forest where there's different people, different birds, uh, at different points that aren't even tuned together, because there's no way that if there's a forest full of 20 birds, there's no way they can agree on a tuning like an orchestra. All right, so I'm going to play a little bit of music, play along with it, and then I'll uh, get off the stage and let the next act come on. It's a few different birds, so maybe I'll just try playing on something with it. Oh yeah. Thanks very much. <laughs>